the Biden administration has been trying to float what Thomas Friedman labeled the quote unquote Biden doctrine for the future of the Middle East. And it essentially involved Saudi Arabia normalizing relations with Israel at the end of all of this, even though the Saudis have really indicated, hey, we're not interested in that unless there is a Palestinian state, something that of course Netanyahu rejects completely out of hand also as a non-starter. Um, so Kirby, John Kirby, put this up on the screen, had just said recently that, oh, we received positive feedback from Saudi Arabia and Israel that they're willing to continue to have normaliz normalization discussions. These were ongoing before October 7th, you'll recall. It was according to, again, White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby. This apparently really pissed off the Saudis because they felt the need to put out a statement directly in response and even sort of like calling out John Kirby directly that this does not reflect their position at all. Put this up on the screen. So this is a statement from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs regarding the discussions between Saudi, Saudi Arabia, USA, and the Arab-Israeli Arab peace process. Let me read. This isn't all that long. They see the Ministry of Foreign Affairs stated that regarding the discussions between Saudi and USA and the Arab-Israeli peace process, and in light of what has been attributed to the U.S. National Security Spokesperson, that would be Kirby, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs affirms that the position of Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has always been steadfast on the Palestinian issue and the necessity that the brotherly Palestinian people obtain their legitimate rights. The kingdom has communicated its firm position to the U.S. administration that there will be no diplomatic relations with Israel unless an independent Palestinian state is recognized on the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital and that the Israeli aggression on the Gaza Strip stops and all Israeli occupation forces withdraw from the Gaza Strip. The kingdom reiterates its call to the permanent members of the UN Security Council that have not yet recognized the Palestinian state to expedite the recognition of the Palestinian state on the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital so that the Palestinian people can obtain their legitimate rights and so that a comprehensive and just peace is achieved for all. I mean, it's somewhat diplomatic language, but Sagar, in the like mm -hmm. diplomatic speak, this is as much of an over-the-top smackdown as you could possibly get in the situation. The reason it matters is because Saudi normalization is something that the Israelis have wanted for years. The Saudi, look, the Saudi royal family themselves, they don't care about the Palestinians and they don't even care about Israelis. But Saudi Arabia is a big country. They have a big population. And yeah. their population, they care a lot about the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Very, this is the thing that many people don't understand is that the Gulf monarchies and even you know the monarchy of Jordan, for example, these people are educated in the West. I mean, they, you know, they're real politique. As long as they can hang out in the South of France, they don't care. But their people, I mean, in many cases, they're poor and they're very identified with the Palestinian cause. They are not as integrated with Western society and all that. And for them, this is a deeply emotional mm -hmm. issue such that if the Saudis are seen to leave the Palestinians behind in any way by normalizing relations, it's just, it's a complete non-starter. It would actually put the monarchy at risk, something yeah. that they will never withstand. Part of the reason that they've been and taken the posture that they've had. It's something that the U.S. and, I, in my opinion, diplomats often forget in our dealings with them is like the Saudi king does not speak for the Saudi people. Sometimes he does, but you know, in, in cases like this, definitely not. Yeah, you know, he didn't get educated. Most of these people ain't educated in Sandhurst or Georgetown or whatever. Like they are Arab, and their very identification with the Arab, with Arab nationalism, with Arab cause, and they hate Israel with a fiery passion. Yeah, I mean, there was a, uh, there was a, a, I think it was a leak, or maybe mm. an administration official officially said this on the record, but they mm -hmm. put out to the press, like, oh, just before October 7th, we totally were going to work on with Saudi, this track to Palestinian statehood, and then October 7th just ruined everything. It, it's total nonsense. The Saudis thought they could get away with normalization when the Palestinians were being, like, erased as an issue and when they're completely on the back burner. Mm -hmm. No longer possible because of all of the energy um, in Saudi and throughout the region on behalf of the Palestinian people. And as I said uh, to you before, Sagar, you know, a lot of these countries have been sort of humiliated by South Africa, who stepped up and they were the ones that filed the charges mm -hmm. with the ICJ and accused Israel of genocide. Any one of these countries could have done the same, but they didn't. And so even though it's a monarchy, it's not anything close to a democracy, they still have to respond to pressure from their people. Absolutely. And if they were seen, so for John Kirby to be out there like, oh yeah, they're still interested in normalizing with Israel without having a clear cut Palestinian state along 1967 borders, 
they felt the need to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. That is not our position at all. We told you that's not our position. We are very clear about where we stand on all of this. And so it really is, a, once again, an extraordinary humiliation and rebuke of the U.S., and our posture in the region. And the last thing that I wanna share with you with regard to Israel, because there was a lot of interesting polling that recently came out about the Israeli people themselves, put this up on the screen. So it continues to be the case that a uh, majority of Israelis say they do not want a Palestinian state or peace with Arab countries. Um, half of Israelis would oppose a deal to end the war in Gaza if it includes Palestinian statehood and peace agreements with other Arab countries. Only 39% think Israel is ensuring the security of its citizens as well. So the, um, there's you know real indictment of the current Israeli government that's kind of across the board. Uh, in addition, this, again, underscores the weakness of Netanyahu's position. About 71% of Israelis would like to see early elections. Uh, their current elections are scheduled for November 2026. 71% are saying, no, 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 no. We can't wait till then. We got to either have them, and there's a split in opinion between, we should just have them right now, which is kind of what the quote-unquote left in Israel wants and the Arab population in Israel wants, or, hey, we can wait till the war's over, but then we need to have elections. So, that polling is in the back of Netanyahu and the rest of the war cabinet, by the way, of their mind when they're making all of these decisions about how to proceed. And then I referenced this before, but I want to underscore it again. They also asked about the main goals of the war in Gaza, whether bringing home the Israeli hostages or toppling Hamas should be the priority. About half said bringing home the hostages, 51% should be the main focus, while 36% said it should be destroying the terror group in the Strip. But, you know, you have a majority of Israeli society that says we do not want a Palestinian state. And what does that tell you? It tells you that if it is going to be, if that's going to be a real thing and not just a thing that U.S. politicians say to pretend like they give a shit about Palestinians, mm -hmm. then the U.S. is going to have to really use some muscle and basically force a solution on the Israelis. That's really the only way that this would ever happen. And even then, it would be, you know, not a certain situation. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that emotions run hot. I would say that if you are in the middle of a hostage situation in a full-blown war, and you've still got the polling where it is right now, a couple years from now, guns are not there, some hostages get returned, I could see a difference in the opinion. I mean, it's one of those where I actually was shocked by the numbers, considering I thought it would be two-thirds or you know maybe even three-fourths who were opposed to a Palestinian state. I think people there are gonna get to a point too where, look, right now you're in but war fever, you know, you're in the middle of it, Take a year. Israelis, you guys love to travel. I'll you know, meet you all over the world. Try traveling a little bit. See what the global reaction is like. You know, to get denied from a few countries, get meet people in a, ho in a hostel or whatever. And they're like, oh, you know, you're you know, something like that. That's going to start to sting. And then you're going to have to get to a situation where you have to reconcile yourself to the international community on top of U.S. pressure. And I could see things going to 50 percent or so not that long from now. You're you're right, like we're gonna have to press, there's no question, you're gonna have to force their hand. But yeah. I also could see democratic sentiment in Israel, especially when Bibi is finally gone, Smotrich, ben, all these other people no longer given you know, the bully pulpit, we're not in the middle of a war, you don't have a baby being held hostage and all that. I could see things changing, I yeah, really could. Yeah, maybe, I mean, yeah. there's no guarantee. It, it is worth remembering that are, there have been many previous situations in uh, world history mm -hmm. where you had two groups of people you know, killing each other are totally at odds, seems like an intractable conflict. And it's actually not that long after you're able to negotiate some sort of settlement where there really is like genuine peace. Every points to Ireland. Yeah, right? I was going to say. It's a perfect example of when that. When we were in graduate school for my security thing, uh, one of the papers, very rarely school assignments stick with you, but it was this like uh, statistical study where, and this sounds weird, but the more attempts at ceasefire that there are, the more likely peace is there in the end. Yeah. And it sounds trite, but what it really means is that the mere act of talking, even though most talks will fall apart, is a precursor to an eventual peace. It actually makes sense, which if you, if you don't talk at all, then you can't ever arrive at peace. And so even though most talks are intractable, they fail, they fall apart. I think the vast majority of ceasefires actually have resumption of conflict, not two months like what I was talking about. But, you know, for example, in Syria, we negotiate a ceasefire and we have one two days later. It kept, we had nine, 10, 11, 12, whatever. The po whole point though is that the mere act of talking eventually does lead to Breakdown uh, to breakthroughs and populations can shift very, very quickly whenever they are led by people. So that's one that sticks with me here, and part of the reasons why I think talking, even the mere act, as 
maddening and all this is to cover is that it can be uh, very beneficial in the future. Part of the reason I'm rooting for some sort of ceasefire agreement to actually come. Yeah, to absolutely. I yeah. mean, you know, to, on the flip side, there's no guarantee that whatever comes after Netanyahu will be more open to peace than Netanyahu is. I mean, he's staked basically his entire career on blocking a Palestinian state. There's a reason why, you know, he's been able to ascend to power multiple times while staking out the, that position. It's because of, it's a position that is wi widely held in Israeli society. I do think it's noteworthy that in spite of October 7th, I mean, these poll numbers about statehood basically haven't really moved during this current conflict, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I probably would have predicted right after October 7th that, you know, those in favor of a Palestinian state, I mean, it would just be like sort of completely wiped out. So the fact that you even have like roughly a third that is in still like, okay, but we should, you know, look towards statehood or I would accept at least statehood, you know, and that that hasn't further deteriorated. I guess I can take that as like a, a positive sign that there is some potential for peace because the reality is like there is no military solution to this conflict. Of course not. Period. Yeah. End of story. The only way that Israelis and Palestinians are going to be able to live in, you know, peace and with some relative security, et cetera, is through a negotiated settlement that recognizes <clears throat> the basic rights of the Palestinian people and provides them with some sort of a um, of statehood, you know, that's legitimate. That's not like fake. Like Biden's sort of also like floating these ideas that would effectively result in what they call like state minus, which right. wouldn't be real sovereignty. I mean, it has to be something approaching genuine statehood for the situation to be resolved. But One the yeah, thing we can ahead. look back to yeah. is disengagement from Gaza. Ariel Sharon, I mean, he's, you know, by many, he's a war criminal, right? But he was the guy behind the disengagement from Gaza. I have it here in front of me. 65% of voters in a referendum on May 2nd, 2004, opposed the disengagement plan. Government went through it anyway. You know why? Because the Bush administration was like, you're doing this. It's going to happen. So it's one of those where we have the ability and they can buck their own thing. And now in retrospect, you know, look, there's a lot of things to say about disengagement from Gaza and all that. But it's a good example of how they rooted their people, settlers, out of the Gaza Strip. And they're like, you're getting kicked out, period, end of story. That could be, uh, you know, that could be one a precursor for what the West Bank would look like in the future. And their ability, you know, if the government wants to do it, they can get it done. Yeah. It's, it's just going to require some political capital and then diplomatic pressure on our end. Yeah, your point being yeah. not that that was good for Palestinians because it wasn't. I mean, right. the conditions in Gaza Strip dramatically deteriorated. There were no complete blockade and siege, machine guns pointed in at them, et cetera. But that they did something that was unpopular exactly. from, with the population. Yes, exactly. The Israelis can do it if they want to. Yeah, the end result, I mean, there, there's a lot of people to blame for that one, mostly Bush, but we'll get to that for a second. <laughs> hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.